for those of you that have logged on or signed on, um, I'm going to go ahead and give a few more minutes to see if others want to join. Um, I kind of would like this to be informal, so if at any point you have a question, please feel free to either ask it out or to type it in the chat box. I'll try and keep track of the chat box so I can um, answer questions. Also, um, I have it set, I think, where it might automatically mute you, but I undid that so that you can, um, if you want to call in or talk over your computer, you can do that. Or if you would like to just um, put messages in the chat box. Either way works for um, asking questions. Um, and this is a new series or a way of, I would like to be able to get more information out and answer people's questions. And so, you know, when we get done with today, we're going to talk about nutrition. And I try to gear it towards what needs to be known for the um, advancement level three, as far as like the feed chart and those kind of things. Um, there's a lot more information in nutrition that I could share, but I try to keep it pretty basic and then um, start with that information. But then um, I'm hoping to continue these webinars on a monthly basis. So if there's more topics that you'd like covered. Um, and then at the end, I do have a little quick survey that if you could fill out, mainly just so I can get some feedback on how it's going so that I can change them or make them better for a future. But then also it has a list of topics or a spot where you can type in topics um, so that I can have new stuff for other months. Um, another thing I would like to do with these in the future is also have other people come in that are experts in different areas um, to do the webinars. So I chose to do this first one, but in the future they won't necessarily be me. Um, I will always be on them to answer questions, um, but I'm hoping to have others be able to join, especially there's lots of people out there that are experts in different areas. Um, and then, so once we get through this nutrition section, if you do have questions on anything related to the 4-H course program, I can try and answer those at this time as well. Um, but hopefully that will get us started. So I think, so, couple minutes after six. I kind of wanted to wait just a little bit longer just in case people are struggling to get on um, to make sure that they can join. Oh, and one thing, this reminds me, um, someone wrote the, to grab a notebook, but I will have the, the PowerPoint slides and some additional handouts um, all in a box folder with a link that I'll give you at the end of this um, that you can go in and get all of this information and use it however you would like um, as I want it to be open, everyone can use it as much as they want, or go back to it, because um, some of the calculations on how to calculate your nutrients for your horse, um, this way you can go in and look at it again at a later date. And then also there's some practice worksheets on practicing going through that. Okay, well I guess I'll go ahead and get started um, with what I have. And so I tried, I wasn't sure where I should start, so I tried to start um, kind of at the beginning about the horse's digestive system and um, what kind of animal they are. And so um, the beginning, they're non-ruminant herbivore or hindgut fermenter. And so a lot of times I like to think of them as a combination between a monogastric animal and a ruminant animal. And so they have one stomach similar to a monogastric, but then they're similar to a ruminant animal in that they have a large microbial population to break down um, their roughage or that type of 
uh, feed material. Um, however, instead of it being in the foregut, similar to like a ruminant animal, it's going to be after their small intestine in their cecum is going to be the primary site of that roughage digestion and that fermentation. Um, some interesting things, they do have a very small stomach in comparison to the size of the animal. Um, it only holds about two to four gallons for an average thousand pound horse. And so it can limit the amount of feed intake. Um, one thing to take note of or to think about with a horse with that small of a stomach, if you feed them a, you know, twice a day large meal, which is kind of a common feeding practice with horses, especially in the United States, then you're gonna have potential that there's not a whole lot of digestion gonna happen and take place in the stomach because once the stomach is two thirds full, it's automatically gonna start pushing um, feed material out of the stomach and into the small intestine, regardless of how much digestion is taking place. And so that's just one thing that happens with a large amount of feed at a couple meals a day. Um, ideally, horses were meant to thrive on a high fiber diet, so a high uh, roughage diet. Um, and they originally were evolved to spend about 16 hours a day grazing. And so today, our feeding practices, we've changed that a lot in how we manage horses. Um, I would say there are still those horses out there that are out on pasture and are grazing 16 hours a day. I would say there's a lot of horses though today that are living in either small pens or stalls um, that don't necessarily have a lot of grass and forage for them to graze. And so they're eating, you know, two to three times a day in, in a more of a meal type setting. So this slide kind of goes through the same things that I just talked about, about being um, utilized roughages, specifically because of their cecum. It contains uh, a, a microbial population that is there specifically for breaking down and fermenting um, that roughage material. On here, I have a link to a video. I'm not going to show it today because it's kind of long, but if you go back into these slides um, that I'll give you the link to later, it's a good video. It's put together by Purina and it goes through kind of how the digestion takes place. I would say it's not probably the best for really young youth, but your senior age or your older youth, um, it's a really good video on how that digestion works and takes place and where different nutrients are going to be broken down. So moving past the stomach to the small intestine, it's about 50 to 70 feet long. It holds about 10 to 12 gallons. Um, I would say a large percentage of all the nutrients that are fed to your horse are going to be broken down and absorbed in the small intestine. Um, so protein, your soluble carbohydrates, and those are gonna be like your grains that you're feeding your horse, um, the sugary components of the roughage. Um, those are all gonna be your soluble carbohydrates and then your fat, which are gonna be broken down in the small intestine. Um, and then most vitam vitamins are also gonna be absorbed in the small intestine. So the small intestine is really important for utilizing and absorption of uh, quite a bit of our nutrients that we feed to our horse. And then after the small intestine is a cecum, uh, it's about three to four feet long. It holds about seven to eight gallons. It's a blind ended pouch. So there's one entrance and exit from the cecum. The feed from the small intestine goes into the cecum where then it's gonna be broken down and digested, fermented by bacteria and protozoa, um, and mainly your roughages and your um, insoluble carbohydrates. But not to say that your grains aren't gonna make it to the cecum. There are, you know, only if you feed a large meal and they eat all of it, the rate of passage is pretty quick. And so some grain may make it all the way into the cecum. And that bacteria and protozoa are set up if you know your horse is on a consistent, regular diet, they're being fed the same things every day, then their cecum and that bacterial population is set up to be able to break down that feed pretty easily. 
so that's just kind of their the breakdown um, after that would be the large intestine or uh, small and large colon um, and in that area we're going to have a lot of absorption of nutrients that are broken down in the cecum and then also a large absorption of water. So the next thing I kind of wanted to go into was the main classes of nutrients and there's six of them. Um, I would say the member manual does group some of the nutrients together and calls them energy. However, I would like to consider energy is made up of protein, carbohydrates, and fat. So um, instead, I would like to say that there's six, the protein, carbohydrates, fat, vitamins, minerals, and water. And I'm going to go through a little bit on um, information about each of these and where they get them in their feed and what they're used for. So this next slide, this has the site of digestion and absorption. And I think this is kind of important for understanding where in their digestive system certain things are going to be broken down. And when you feed a certain type of feed, where it's being utilized. And so our soluble carbohydrates, so see, another thing to mention is CHO is the abbreviation for carbohydrates. And so um, I might use that in various places throughout this. Um, SI stands for the small intestine, and then the cecum and large intestine or colon, um, you can see on this table. So protein, 60 to 70% of the protein in the horse's diet is going to be broken down and absorbed in the small intestine, and about 30 to 40% will be in the cecum and large intestine. Your soluble carbohydrates, those are going to be your grains that you feed your horse, um, and about 60 to 75% of that is going to be in the small intestine, 35 to 25 in the cecum and large intestine. Um, fiber, that's going to be like your roughage, your hays that you're feeding are going to have a high quantity of fiber. Um, and that is going to be largely in your cecum and colon. And then fats, almost all fat, 90% is going to be in the small intestine, broken down and absorbed. Calcium is the small intestine. Phosphorus is the, mainly the large intestine. And then our vitamins, the fat soluble vitamins are going to be broken down in the small intestine and absorbed and then water soluble in the cecum and colon. So more information on protein. Um, as I said in the previous slide, the primary site of digestion is the small intestine. Um, dietary protein, so that is protein that you feed to your horse is going to be broken down mainly in the small intestine and into specific amino acids. And so the amino acids that you feed to your horse come from the protein that's found in that grain or hay. Um, they're all, they all contain amino acids and then are supplied to the horse and broken down through enzymes in the small intestine. Um, and then once, if there's some of that feed goes on and gets broken down in the cecum by the microorganisms, then it's broken down into microbial amino acids or a microbial protein. And then there is some of that that's going to be absorbed um, in the large intestine, but the majority is in the small intestine. Um, I listed here the essential amino acids. I would say it's good to know, but that's not the most important. But the biggest amino acid that to think about and to really pay attention to on your horse's diet would be lysine. Because if we're not supplying enough lysine in their diet, then it's going to be the first rate limiting amino acid. So if there's not an, what that means is if there's not not enough lysine being fed to the horse, it's going to limit how much of the other amino acids are able to be absorbed and produced. And so we want to make sure that our horse's diets contain enough lysine. And I would say most grains um, feeds that are produced today 
are on the feed tag are going to list the lysine content and they do that because it is a very important amino acid to be fed. <clears throat> and so when we feed our horses, our protein requirement for mature maintenance is mainly just to maintain homeostasis. So protein is the biggest use of protein in the horse's body is going to be for muscle development and cell uh, rebuilding of cells and tissues. And I would say most horses, if you have them on a, a good pasture, they can probably get all the protein they require just from a good quality forage. However, if once you add work to a horse, so exercise, and you are riding a horse consistent, consistently, then you potentially may need to add a grain or something to supplement that protein so they get enough. Um, and one thing to, when you're looking at your horses, um, a lot of times we talk about body condition score, which is, you know, their appearance and when you feel them, the, the fat covering their body. Um, with, with protein, one way to tell if your horse is not necessarily getting the amount of protein because so, that is to look at their muscle quality and their muscle, especially over their rump and the top of their back. If they're struggling, like if they look like they're fat and you're keeping weight on them, but they seem to not be gaining muscle and, um, seem to not be strong over their back, that could be an indication that potentially they need a higher quality protein or they need more protein in their diet. Um, and one thing about protein as well, contrary to what we would like to think, because when you go buy a bag of horse feed, they're always listed as a 12% protein or 14 or 16%, and we uh, it's marketed to the protein content. However, horses actually don't have a very high protein requirement compared to some other animal species. And so it's interesting that that's the way it's marketed, but it, that's just the way they've done it, and people think of it that way. And so, um, but exercise only slightly increases the protein requirement of a mature horse. The only thing I would say is with those feeds, they're not required to necessarily tell you what that protein quality is or what the amino acid profile is. And that does differ from one feed to the next. And later when we get to calculating um, crude protein or the protein content of a feed, that they may be meeting their protein requirement, but if you're just feeding a simple grain, oats, or corn, they may be meeting their protein requirement, but they may not be meeting their amino acid requirements. And so so I would recommend that, you know, you check the lysine content and those kind of things as well as just looking at um, crude protein. Um, it's not a requirement of our youth to be able to do that, but it's just, I think, something that if you are feeding your horses it's, and you want to know, it's a better way to estimate whether or not your horse is meeting its true amino acid needs and protein needs. So some common protein sources um, that have really good amino acid profiles uh, that are commonly added to our horse feeds would be soybean meal, linseed meal, and cottonseed meal. And you might notice on some feed tags, they may not specifically say which type of um, amino acid that they're feeding. Um, it may just say a protein meal or something of that nature. And then that way that feed company can potentially change which um, protein source they're using. Um, and so it's just something to pay attention to. Some of them will list it out and then you know that's what they're using. And then some um, they're gonna try and use whichever is the cheapest at the time. <clears throat> so moving to carbohydrates, 
Um, carbohydrates provide probably one of the largest components of our energy requirement needed by horses. And they're going to get carbohydrates both from um, grains and from the hays that we feed them. Um, most uh, carbohydrates, the energy requirement is going to be measured in digestible energy, and this is going to be expressed in megacalories. Um, I will say this is one thing that is kind of a pain. Um, most feed companies actually do not list on their grains that they um, sell the digestible energy. They're going to list the protein, the calcium, the phosphorus, potentially the lysine, but they're not required to list the digestible energy. And so when it comes to calculating your horse's nutrient requirements, it sometimes is difficult because you're not going to have um, the digestible energy found in, all, in those grains. So the two groups of carbohydrates are soluble and insoluble. <clears throat> our soluble are going to be our grains, the starches and sugars, and they're primarily absorbed, digested in the small intestine. And this, that breakdown and digestion is done by um, enzymes, specifically carbohydrates, that are going to break down those soluble carbohydrates into starch and glucose or other five, six carbon sugars. And some of those soluble carbohydrates will reach the large intestine, where then they will be fermented by bacteria. And then the ending result of that fermentation process is going to be volatile fatty acids. And they're going to be utilized as an energy source. But either way, your end product of glucose or sugars or volatile fatty acids are all going to be used by the body to produce energy. And then our insoluble carbohydrates, this is going to be your roughage, your haze, um, are, are mainly made up of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. And there is no enzymes made by the horse that can digest and break these down, which is why the need for microorganisms. And those microorganisms are found mainly in their cecum. There's some in the large intestine, but in, mainly in their cecum. And they're going to break down that hay roughage through fermentation into the volatile fatty acids. Um, forages only have about six to eight percent soluble carbohydrates, so those easily broken down sugars and glucose, and the rest is going to be made up of insoluble carbohydrates, cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. So the next energy source is going to be fat. Um, a lot of feeds today have increased the amount of fat in them and um, are a great energy source for horses. So dietary lipids or dietary fat are digested and absorbed in the small intestine. Um, body fat on the horse is going to be influenced by the composition of the dietary fat. So the more um, fat being fed to your horse, the more fat your horse potentially will be, depending on the amount of exercise and utilization of that energy source. Um, so someone asked me about soluble or insoluble carbs. I wouldn't say that either is better or worse. Um, horses need both, potentially, depending on their exercise level and exercise load. Um, Horses are meant and capable of surviving on just insoluble carbohydrates, so just our hays and roughages. However, if you add exercise to what you're doing with your horse, it's potential that they're not going to meet their energy requirement with just roughage and are going to need grains in order to meet those requirements. Um, but neither is worse or better. Um, they're just broken down in different areas. So your soluble is broken down in your small intestine through enzymes, and your insoluble is broken down mainly in your cecum through bacteria, protozoa, microorganisms that are doing that uh, fermentation and breaking it down for utilization by the horse. So I wouldn't say either is bad or good. They potentially need both. They're just broken down differently. Um, 
So another interesting thing about fat digestion for the horse is horses do not have a gallbladder. So for instance, with us, when we eat a meal, we have our gallbladder is storing bile. And then whenever we eat a meal, it sends signals to our gallbladder to release bile into our small intestine to break down um, that fat. Whereas horses, they were originally meant to eat oh, about 16 hours a day and grazing. And so they're meant to always kind of be eating and having food in their system. And so they don't have a gallbladder. Instead, they're just constantly uh, having a trickling or dripping of bile from their liver into their small intestine on a regular basis. And so they're not going to get like a big surge of bile when they have a meal. Instead, they constantly have uh, levels of bile in their small intestine to break down fat. And so what this means is if you are feeding horses, you want to make sure that if you want to add energy through fat, which it's a good source of energy for your horse, you want to make sure that you increase that fat low fat level over several weeks. So if you, for instance, like a lot of people top dress or add, you know, a fourth of a cup or a half a cup of corn oil to their grain to increase fat in their horse's diet. And especially for some of those horses that really don't need more grain and they don't need necessarily more protein and other um, nutrients, but they need more fat, you can add fat to their diet. But one thing to make sure you think about when doing that is to increase that amount of fat slowly over several weeks because then their body will build up tolerance and the ability to break down that fat easily with the increase in bile production and secretion of, of bile. But it takes them a little while in their system to develop that ability, you know, for it to build up where they can handle larger and larger quantities. Um, if you increase the fat too quickly, it's just going to go through their system. It's not going to be broken down. Um, it, it just takes a little while for it to happen. Um, but it will. They can actually have a, up to, they have done studies where horses can have up to 20% of their diet is fat. I would not recommend that, but it's been shown that they can handle large fat amount, large quantities of fat. Um, I would say that is not the norm. Most diets are about 5% fat. Um, so next, I was going to talk about vitamins. So our Fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, are absorbed in the small intestine. And fat-soluble vitamins, they use fat to bind to and to help with the digestive process. And so it makes sense that if fat is being um, digested and absorbed in the small intestine, then your fat-soluble vitamins are also going to be absorbed in your small intestine with that other fat. Um, Carotene is an important vitamin for your horses, but if they're getting adequate supplies of vitamin A, then they should be able to produce their own carotene. Um, and then dietary B vitamins are absorbed in the small intestine. However, one problem with our B vitamins is microorganisms in their large intestine actually make B vitamins from the feed, um, produce them. However, they're absorbed in the small intestine. So it's a little late in their system. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're feeding them adequate B vitamins um, since they are going to be producing their own B vitamins, but later in their system where they're not then going to be absorbed at a very high rate in the large intestine. So minerals, two of the big ones we talk about the most are probably calcium and phosphorus. Um, but other ones are important, magnesium and zinc. Those are all gonna be absorbed in the small intestine. Um, calcium is actively absorbed in the small intestine. I would say phosphorus is, the majority of phosphorus is actually absorbed in the large intestine. And so 
That is why we say that the calcium to phosphorus ratio is one and a half to one to two to one. So for every two calcium, for every one phosphorus, we need two calcium. And part of this is because phosphorus and calcium bind together and phosphorus likes to grab calcium and bind it to it and take it from the small intestine to the large intestine where the phosphorus is then absorbed, but it's too late for the calcium because the calcium has to be free and not attached to a phosphorus to be absorbed in the small intestine. And so that's part of why we need to feed double the amount of calcium that we have of phosphorus so that that calcium, the free, pho the free calcium can then be absorbed in the small intestine and not be stuck and attached to a phosphorus going all the way to the large intestine. So um, that's part of the reasoning why there is that recommended ratio of your calcium to phosphorus of two to one. And then finally, the last nutrient is water. Um, the cecum and large intestine is, pro is the primary site of net water absorption. So um, it's going to be pulled off the feed in the cecum and large intestine and utilized in different areas of the body. Um, if you have a high grain diet, you're going to have a lower water content in their, feed, in their feces. If you have a high hay diet, you're going to have a higher water content. And that is part of just the particle size and the ability to pull the water away from those particles um, later in the system. So with high grain diets, it gets broke down, broken down into a really fine particles. And so it's harder, um, it's easier to pull the water away from it. Okay, so I was gonna, I just wanted to kind of cover that basic information on those nutrients, but then I wanna go into some feeds and feeding and then um, calculating your nutrient requirements, specifically that feed chart that is required in our level three advancement level for you to be able to complete and fill out. Um, this way you have examples and can go through it. Um, I would say once you get the hang of it and have done it, it's not that hard, but if you've never done it, it can be confusing and difficult. Um, so Back to horses are intended to be grazing animals. Ideally, they're meant to eat a high roughage, high pasture, hay diet. Um, however, if you're gonna add work or exercise to it, to the horse, then you potentially are gonna need greater nutrients because of that greater energy need. Um, so typically you're going to receive the nutrients from hay, pasture, grain, or a combination of these, depending on what you choose to feed or what's available to you. Um, but our roughages are actually very important to our horse. A horse does have a minimum requirement for roughage. They can do without grain, but they really cannot do without roughages or hay, pasture. And the minimum roughage requirement is 1% of their body weight per day. So that would equal to one pound of forage per 100 pounds of body weight. Or a 1,000 pound horse is going to need a minimum of 10 pounds of roughage per day. If your horse isn't eating any grains, then on average, they'll eat about one and a half to two percent of their body weight per day. So 15 to 20 pounds for a thousand pound horse of hay per day. Um, as our horses get older, some of our geriatric horses potentially have issues with chewing and we don't always provide them necessarily hay, but then you would want to provide a complete feed. There are grains out there or feeds that are produced and manufactured that are considered a complete feed. And so they'll list them that they don't have to be fed with a roughage or with a hay. But that means that those feeds also contain a roughage in the pellets. Usually they have alfalfa um, within the pellet. Um, 
concentrates, we usually consider our grains and protein supplements that you're going to add. I would say the most common horse rations consist of oats, corn, and soybean meal. Um, however, there are tons of other things out there that are added to horse feeds um, and that our horses are capable of eating. Um, like beet pulp is a, new, a newer type feed or um, our distiller's grains and some of those are added to horse feeds. And they definitely provide different types of nutrients. But I would say the most common in a horse ration would be oats. Um, and one reason oats are such a good feed for horses is they're really low in energy, but they're high in fiber. And so they have higher like roughage type content. It's not really roughage, but higher fiber content and then less energy or sugar, which they don't necessarily need. Um, corn is also another common grain for in a horse feed and it's really high in energy but and low in protein quality and so um, depending on what you're needing your horse and what hay type of hay you're giving it can definitely be a good feed. But one thing to consider with most grains is they're going to be really low in calcium and high in phosphorus and so if you're not feeding um, a manufactured feed, they're going to add calcium to the feed in order to meet those calcium requirements. However, if you're just going to feed oats or corn and some type of hay, um, it's something you'd want to pay attention to and you might need to feed like a mineral um, type salt block or mineral supplement that contains um, a calcium supplement. So some rules of thumb or things to at least think about with feeding is to feed by weight and not by volume. Um, I know, for instance, for myself growing up, you know, we just fed a coffee can of grain twice a day to our horses, regardless of what was in that coffee can of grain and um, or we fed a flake of hay regardless of how much that hay weighed. And I think once you have an idea of what the weight of your grain is or the weight of your hay is for a flake, then that works out good. But in the beginning, you kind of need to weigh things so that you can under, you can do the calculations that we're going to do here in a little bit that tell you whether or not your horse is meeting its requirements. So on here, I have an example of like oats that three pound coffee can or that coffee can that we would say it weighs three pounds when it's full of feed has in this example um, it would have oats and corn in it and if it just had oats in that same coffee can without any other grain it weighs about four pounds that one coffee can or that same amount of corn in a coffee can is going to weigh about six pounds because oats are a lot lighter than the corn. And then when you look at the energy content of those oats or the corn, that four pounds of oats, um, oats contain approximately 1.2 megacals of digestible energy per pound. And so if you calculate the four pounds times the 1.2 megacals of digestible energy. You have about 4.8 megacals of energy in one coffee can if it's just oats. And then if you do the same calculation though for corn, which corn is a lot higher energy feed, it's gonna be 1.55 approximately megacals of digestible energy. And then in that same coffee can, can if it's corn, it's gonna be 9.3 megacals of energy. So it's a big difference in the energy content depending on how much of that feed is oats or corn or what you're feeding. So just something to think about when you're looking at what to feed them. <coughs> so the next thing we want to do is we want to be able to determine whether or not they're meeting their requirements. And so I want to say that you always should feed based on the class of the horse. And so this would mean they have mature horse, no exercise, and usually on the table, it'll be considered maintenance. Um, if it says maintenance, it m usually means a horse that's no exercise, just an adult horse. Um, 
And so you can use those numbers. Working horse is usually listed light, moderate, or intense. Um, and this table that's on here, this is from the 4-H member manual. Um, I took it out so that you can use this one. Um, but you can also get these same kind of tables um, if you Google it online pretty easily. But the first thing you need, ooh, went too far, to do when trying to determine if the feed is meeting your horse's nutritional requirements is first you got to figure out what your horse's requirements are. And the first thing you have to know is how much your horse weighs in order to do this. Um, and so either use a scale, which would be ideal. However, I would say 99% of us do not own a scale large enough to weigh our horses. And so in that case, um, if you have a weight tape, um, they're really pretty accurate. I would say they're not exact, but they're pretty accurate in estimating your horse's weight. And most feed stores get them from f for free and are given to them from most a lot of the feed companies. So if you ask your feed store, a lot of times they'll just give you one. Um, or there is a calculation you can use in order to estimate their weight. And to do this, you would need to measure the heart girth of your horse. So right around where the girth of your horse would go, all the way up around their withers and around their belly. And that would measure your heart girth and you want to measure that in inches. And then your body length, that's going to be around the front of your horse up, like, so around their chest or, and then around behind them. Kind of where you would measure them if you were trying to buy a blanket for your horse. It's going to be the same area that you're going to measure. So their point of their shoulder around their buttocks area is going to give you their body length. And so to use this calculation, you do the heart girth squared. So heart girth, that number multiplied by itself. And then you're going to multiply that number by their body length. And then divide the whole, the number you get there by 330. And that will give you the weight of your horse. And if you look in the member manual, you can find um, a picture on page 21 that shows you where to measure. So I put this table in here. This is the table that the youth are supposed to fill out for um, level three, their fee chart for determining what um, their horse requires. But also I would say as a general, everybody, it's a good thing to calculate out what your horse is requires and then what they're getting from their feed to know if you're really meeting their requirements. Because the only way you'll know is if you actually do these calculations and figure it out. Um, and you can find this feed chart on the 4-H horse website um, under advancement levels and under advancement level three. It does list this chart, chart and you can type on it. It's in Excel format so you can um, utilize it. So to complete the feed chart, you need to determine what your horse's nutrient requirements are. Um, and this, you'll need a nutrient requirement NRC nutrient requirement committee table and there is examples of this in the member manual that you can use that are on page 18 um, but also if you don't have a member manual it they do list quite a few of these online and you can google horse NRC table usually you can find them they'll pop up pretty easily then you're also going to need the, the guaranteed analysis of the grain you're feeding. And so this is your feed tag is going to list the guaranteed analysis on the feed tag. And it's basically going to list what the percentages of crude protein, calcium, phosphorus that are in that feed you can find on that guaranteed analysis. I would say if you're mixing your own grains, you can use, there's a table in the member manual on page 19 that gives you estimates of digestible energy, crude protein, calcium, and phosphorus for um, some of the most more common grains like corn and oats. Um, but you can also find 
average oat con uh, nutrient content or soybean meal content if you look online. And then you need to know the type of forage that you're feeding and what the nutrient content of that forage is. And again, you can use that same table in the member manual or um, search online. It's harder to find that. I would say the other thing you can do is have your feed tested, but I would say that's not very common to do. Um, and if you use averages, you're going to be close. You may not be accurate, but you should be close. So here is what um, the table looks like for um, the recommended nutrient concentrations for your horse. And so if you look over here, you can see the type of horse. So our maintenance, a horse that isn't doing any exercise, you know, it's just out to pasture or, you know, you're just not really doing much with, you would want to feed them at the maintenance level. If your horse is exercising, you would want to feed them at the working levels, the light, moderate, or intense. And then pregnant, lactating. Um, if they're growing, you want to feed them in these weanling, yearling, two-year-old stages as they're going to require higher nutrient contents during the, while they're growing. So I'm, I have an example in here of calculating our nutrient requirements of our horse. And so for my example, I'm going to use a mature horse at moderate work. Um, and I'm going to use the table that's in the member manual that tells you the weight of the horse is 1,102 pounds, the digestible energy is 23.3 megacals. One thing I would make sure you know is what the units are that you're using in these calculations. That you're, and this has your crude protein in pounds, your calcium in grams, and your phosphorus in grams. And so I wanted to use a horse that did not weigh 1,102 pounds, just so you could see how you would actually figure out what the requirements were for a larger horse or a smaller horse because that is going to vary. So for instance here I used a 1500 pound horse so it's a very large horse um, at moderate work and the table said that it was an 1102 pound horse so if you take that 1500 pounds divided by the 1102 it gives you 1.36 and that number it's 1.36 um, pounds, you want to take that number and multiply it by all the required numbers from that table to give you then what a 1500 pound horse would require. So I multiplied the 23.3 megacals, which was required for the 1102 pound horse times 1.36, and I got 31.69 megacals. And so this would get you what your horse requires for a 1500 pound horse. If you had a horse that weighed less than 1102 pounds, when you multiply, you'll get a, when you divide that number, you'll get a point something, and that will then give you smaller numbers when you do these calculations. So here I did those calculations. I, Here's an example of the feed chart that I filled in with the name, the horse, how much it weighs, its exercise level, at moderate. Um, and then here I have the requirements, um, the 31.69 megacals of digestible energy, 2.3 pounds of crude protein, 47.6 grams of calcium, 28.56 grams of phosphorus. And then I decided, just for this example, I tried to pick some random feeds, but um, the, a feed is called EQ8 Senior. I'm going to feed 13 pounds, which was on the feed label, the, a suggested amount for a, a horse at, um, that weighed that much that was at um, moderate level of exercise. And then I'm going to feed Brome hay, and the horse weighed 1,500 pounds. The minimum roughage requirement is 1%. And so in this example, I'm feeding the horse 15 pounds. <laughs> 
So this is what I was talking about, the guaranteed analysis that would be found on the feed. And it lists all kinds of things that you could calculate out and determine if it's meeting those requirements. But for this example, we're just going to do crude protein. Um, I didn't want to mention that the lysine was there and you could look at that if you want to, um, calcium and phosphorus. So then here's those calculations in order to determine what the horse is getting in its grain. I will say a lot of grains are not going to list the digestible energy content. And so for this example, I do not have the digestible energy because that, that feed did not list a digestible energy uh, content. But to do the crude protein, so we're feeding 13 pounds of this grain. Um, the grain contained 12% crude protein. So 13 pounds times the 0.12 gives you 1.56 pounds of crude protein. Again, feeding 13 pounds. And then it was 0.7% calcium. I would recommend that you use the minimum amount. Most feeds, they'll say the minimum amount of calcium and the maximum, but you want to make sure you're always feeding enough calcium. So if that green only did contain the minimum, that's what you would want to look at when determining the content. And so another thing to think about too is this table for your calcium and phosphorus is in grams. And um, your book is going to list the requirements and most things are going to say how much calcium and phosphorus they need in grams and not in pounds. So you do have to convert those pounds into grams in order to do your comparison. And so one pound is equal to 453 point blah 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 grams. And so when you do that calculation, you have to convert it over to grams. Um, another thing to note, if it, when you're moving your decimal place for multiplying, you always move two to the left. So 0.7% in a decimal is 0 0.007. And so there you see I did both those calculations for calcium and phosphorus. And then down in the table, the highlighted part, you can see what those amounts equal to. So then I use this table in the member manual in order to get an estimate of what my brome, haze, energy content, crude protein, calcium, phosphorus are. So brome grass is a cool season grass. So I use these numbers here at the top. And then I basically did that same calculation. So digestible energy, 15 pounds times 0.99 megacals which you got from that table. And here you can see I got the content that's found in the hay. And again, converting the calcium from pounds to grams and our phosphorus from pounds to grams. And then in this table, I put everything together and you can see what the totals are when you add everything together. So I have my grain contents, my forage con nutrient contents, and then down here I have the total and the feeds. And you can see that I have excess of our crude protein, calcium, phosphorus, and I don't know what if it's an excess in our digestible energy because the grain did not contain or did not give you a value for its digestible energy. And so um, I would say it probably does have enough, but it's just something you, do, you won't necessarily know from looking at the feed tag. So I did another example using oats and then the calculation, that table again with what the nutrients found in the oats are on average. And this one, then you have 19.5 megacals of just oats. And if you think about most grains are gonna, mixed feeds are gonna contain more than just oats. And so they're probably gonna contain at least that amount. But here you can see those calculations again. Um, of the crude protein, calcium, and phosphorus. And again, here you can see the totals and 
the amount is in excess in all of them. One thing I would like to note though on this um, chart is if you look at your calcium and phosphorus, your calcium total is 50.81 and your phosphorus total is 43.92. And yes, they are well above what they need, like they're required for calcium and phosphorus. The only problem that potentially could happen with this feed is if that phosphorus is binding to the calcium, you potentially are going to be uh, deficient in calcium if it if they're not able to absorb the calcium. So you may need, um, if you're just feeding like oats and grass hay in this example, you may need a mineral um, supplement so that they're getting enough calcium. So it's not that it's not meeting their requirements because looking at the numbers it is, but you just can't be sure on the calcium whether or not they're going to be able to absorb all that calcium. So then the next part of this chart is determining the cost. And so here's a couple examples. The EQ8 Senior costs, in this example, $15 per bag, and the bags weigh about 50 pounds. So to figure out how much one pound of the Senior costs, you take the $15 divided by the 50 pounds, which give you 30 cents per pound. And then you can multiply that times the 13 pounds that you're feeding each day to give you a total for how much it costs per day. And then if there's 30 days in a month, um, you can get your total per month. And then I did the same calculation for your hay, um, $6 with an example of $6 per bale, um, weighing about 70 pounds a bale. And this varies depending on your hay that you buy. This is part of why knowing what your weight of your feed is. Um, so the $6 divided by the 70 pounds is 0.09 or 9 cents um, per pound. And then in this example, we were feeding 15 pounds a day, so it's $1.35 per day, or $40.50 per month. And so then you can complete this part of your chart and fill in the cost per day and the cost per month. So I went through all of that kind of fast. Does anyone have any questions on any of that? Um, I do have on here a link to this a survey that if everyone could fill it out, I will put the link in the chat box so that you can um, go to it. And then also I will put the link to, there's additional resources where you can get this PowerPoint. You can also get some practice uh, worksheets that have practice problems on calculating the costs and calculating the nutrients of your horse. And so I'll put that in the chat box so people can go there if they would like. But also if anyone has any questions right now, I can take those. Let me and with this link that I just put in the chat box, that is to a survey. If you could fill that out, so then also I can get ideas for the next webinar. And also if there's specific topics that people are really interested in, I can try and get um, speakers to come in to talk about different things. Um, if you have more questions on the nutrition and doing these feed charts, please let me know. I would love to give you more information and um, make it where more youth feel comfortable with the nutrition part of the level three. I know that's probably one of the more difficult parts of it. And then, 
And then the next um, link I just put on there, that's the link to the resources. Oh, no, it's not. It gave the same one. Here is the link to the resources where you can get the PowerPoint and those things. But if no one has any more questions, I will let you go. Thank you, thank you for joining. Um, and I will send out an email tomorrow for people to be able to watch this webinar at a later time.